Nicole. There's not enough to call it a suicide. Tonight, 2020's investigation lighting a fire under an eight-year-old cold case. The family's strongest argument is this abrasion. Follow along as we retrace Annie's final hours far from home. So Annie might have been here on Halloween night. No stone left unturned doing the job they say the police didn't. They treated this evidence like trash. From a pastry shop. She goes, oh my gosh, that's she her. Remember. She was here. To a funeral home. We always thought murder right away. The Capitol to the state penitentiary. Our first question was, did you kill our daughter? And finally, the police, with nothing new to say to the parents, but talking to 2020. What do you say to this family who says you didn't do your job, that you left them hanging? Answers for Annie. Good evening, I'm Elizabeth Vargas. David is on assignment tonight. At a time when so many of you have your children home for the summer, these parents have a never-ending mission still trying to find out what happened to their teenage daughter, how she died eight years after the fact, eight years after the police say they do know what happened. What will you decide tonight? Join the conversation. We're live on Facebook and Twitter as Deborah Roberts tries to find answers for Annie. Alexandria, Virginia, a stone's throw from the nation's capital an upscale suburb in Fairfax County with historic cobblestone streets, pleasant homes, and top-notch schools like West Potomac High. On Vantage Drive, it was the picture of tranquility until early Halloween morning in 2008. And then um, this is Annie's room. Is it hard to come in here? No, it's joyful because it's, it's Annie. It was barely 6 a.m. and Dan McCann was saying goodbye to his 16-year-old daughter, Annie, before heading off to his managerial job with TSA in D.C. His wife, Mary Jane, a former White House IT worker and now stay-at-home mom, was on her way to upstate New York to visit the couple's son, Sam, in college. Annie, a high school junior, was a passionate artist and good student who played basketball and made her mom laugh. Annie was funny, quirky, Woody. She was just a delight. She was just a person that everybody, I feel like everybody liked Annie. Former classmate China Johnson Owens first met Annie in seventh grade. Annie McCann was an angel on earth, honestly. Her parents say Annie was young for her age, sheltered and a homebody. There was no Snapchat or Instagram yet, and the McCanns heavily monitored their daughter's time online. She could barely work a flip phone, and she just got her Facebook account. So I said, yes, you can have the Facebook account, but um, I get to look at it when I want. I want the passwords, everything. What's here that she did? It wasn't an issue since Annie preferred drawing and painting anyway. That is really pretty though. Yeah. Look at the colors. Her work decorating the family home. She was talented. Very, very much so. Always put everything in a frame for her so she knew that it was important. Her big obsession was capturing her cherished dog, Breezy Max. She absolutely loved her dog, Breezy. That's and a he's painting. at the top of the I actually thought that was a photo for a no. second. Annie's artistic touch even extended to Halloween with goodie bags she insisted on making. She was too old to trick-or-treat, so she transferred her enthusiasm into giving the gifts out. But just hours before trick-or-treaters would arrive, the first hint of trouble. Annie hadn't phoned her mom, something out of character. Oh, she always called me like clockwork after school. Mary Jane knew her daughter's routine, straight home after school, and if neither mom nor dad were home, she'd call. Up in Ithaca, New York at Sam's College, when Mary Jane didn't get that usual ring of reassurance, she worried. You know, as a mom, you just know. I got this gut, something's not right. And so I called um, a neighbor. I said, are any signs of Annie? No. Any signs of the car? No. Annie used the family's white Volvo to get to and from school. Thoughts going through my mind, oh my God, what if she's, I mean, you're thinking, what if she's, oh my God, what if she's in a car accident? Please, please God, let her be okay. A panic Mary Jane calls Dan, who rushes home and finds the house phone ringing. Would it be Annie or someone who knows where she is? The answer is it's an automated message from the Fairfax County Public School System. 
reporting that your son or daughter was absent today, the whole day. I almost collapsed. So now you realize she was never even at school. Right. So I call the police. Get over here now. There's little to go on, and the Fairfax County officer who arrives isn't overly concerned. Maybe this is a typical teen acting out. People were saying, don't worry, she just ran away, she'll be back. Uh, you know, kids do this all the time. It's not uncommon. Don't worry about it. But Mary Jane is worried. Her daughter is far from rebellious and only recently had gotten her ears pierced. She's diligent about keeping them clean with a first aid spray back teen. Keep that in mind. You won't believe how important it will be later. With no sign of Annie, her mom is frantic and begins making the achingly long six hour drive back home to Virginia. What state are you in as you're driving? I know I drove right through somebody's farm and finally got on some highway. I mean, we were like just stunned in the car and, you know, driving fast and not stopping and, and like, why can't I get this car home faster? We have to find Annie. We didn't know where the hell to go. We didn't know what to do. We did the best we could. How did you get through that first night? I don't know. It was torture, wasn't it? It was torture, yeah. But the torment is only beginning. When the call came in, I was told it was a dead junkie behind a dumpster. Not even 48 hours later, homicide detective Sean Jones responds to a call. I really honestly thought it would be a 20 minute, type it up and be done. Not so much. But the call isn't in Alexandria, it's here the Perkins Homes Housing Project in Baltimore, Maryland, 50 miles and another world away from the McCann's bucolic neighborhood. And behind a dumpster in this section of the so-called Charm City, a man taking out the trash makes a gruesome discovery. And it's no junkie at all. So you find the body of a white teen girl at a predominantly black housing project. What was your first thought? That it was a homicide. It was a homicide and we treated it as such. Jones, a 25-year veteran Baltimore cop, knows right away this is an unusual case. When you first looked at her, was there an apparent cause of death? No. Did it look like she had been beaten up? No. The Perkins Homes covers several square blocks in a high crime area, just minutes from Baltimore's famed Inner Harbor and Camden Yards. Soon enough, Detective Jones discovers that the dead girl has a backpack nearby and papers that reveal a stunning fact. She's not from Baltimore, not even close. I find a hall pass for Fairfax County High Schools. I find her driver's license, and I have people back at the office call the Fairfax PD. A half hour later, the identity is confirmed. It's Annie McCann. Detective Jones leaves the ugly crime scene, driving to suburban Virginia to break the news to the McCanns in person. How is apparent to you even? You can't, you're in shock. Do you ask any questions at this, this point, or are you just collapsed in grief? You're collapsed in grief. How did a sheltered girl from the suburbs wind up here? Amazingly, Annie McCann herself may have left behind the biggest clue. When we come back, the note found in Annie's bedroom. Is it a roadmap to what or who led to her demise? She'd say, dear mom and dad. She'd never write a note not saying, dear mom and dad. What does it reveal? See what happens next. Nightfall in Baltimore, trapped between a dark harbor and sinister sky. A city with a long history of murder and mystery ever since Edgar Allan Poe wrote and died here. Now it's the case of Annie McCann that captivates. How does a white 16-year-old girl from the Virginia suburbs wind up dead here in the projects? Her stunned parents haunted this Halloween night by a note left on their daughter's bed. This morning I was going to kill myself, but I realized I can start over instead. If you really love me, you'll let me go. What started as a suicide note was beginning to sound like a runaway note. Goodbye. I know I'm only 16, but I'm almost 17. I'll be careful. That's how that note ended. I'll be careful. Why would she run away? Was there something brewing that maybe... Well, apparently. But was there something possible that you could look back on and think, maybe she was upset about this? No. Dan called me and told me, and I'm like dropping the phone like, what? What, indeed. 
equally as confounding as what they will learn later, that Annie had taken $1,000 in cash, money she'd stashed away, all her favorite clothes, even a box of Cheerios. But nothing in the note hints at where she's going. Did Baltimore make any sense to you? Did, was there any connection to Baltimore? No connection to Baltimore. No sense at all. Annie could not even find her way to Baltimore. There were all sorts of unusual angles to this. To Washington Post Metro writer Tom Jackman, the mysterious death of a 16-year-old girl is big news. Beyond the fact that a suburban girl was found dead in the inner city of Baltimore, there's no real explanation for how she died. You don't see this very often. No. It wasn't the usual bill of fare for Baltimore homicide detective Sean Jones either. 90 to 95 percent of the cases we're dealing with are African-American males that are shot on a street corner. I'm obviously going to look at this twice uh, and not just glance over it as your average everyday case. Then the case seems to crack like one of those famous Maryland crabs. First, police find Annie's Volvo abandoned at a gas station. Then a tiny clue, a smudge. It's a fingerprint that matches someone already in their database. Could it be Annie's killer? We had to get the fingerprint processed, and then once we got the name back from the fingerprint, that's when that we moved on that. Turns out the print belongs to a teen boy who says he and some friends came across the car in the projects. He says Annie, face down in the back, is already dead. So, as twisted as it sounds, they dump her body and go joyriding in her car. So these boys just dumped her body? Yes, ma'am. And took the car? Yes, ma'am. One young man connected to the group? Darnell Kinlaw. Remember that name because you'll hear it again. But police don't charge him or anyone with assaulting Annie, in part because of the condition of her body. They're certain Annie was not beaten, strangled, stabbed, or shot. When I initially met the McCanns, I made it very clear that I didn't know what we had and that the autopsy 99.9% .9 of the time is going to give us more clarity on what we're dealing with. Then the autopsy results are in, and they're a surprise to everyone. Annie had a small amount of alcohol in her blood, but a large amount of something else, lidocaine. Lidocaine. Lidocaine? 100 lidocaine. It's a drug you may have heard of on those medical shows like Grey's Anatomy. Nasal speculum and lidocaine. To finally relieve your pain, now's the time for lidocaine. It's also a common numbing agent in all kinds of over-the-counter products, including Bactine relieves pain on contact. Bactine, the antiseptic Annie had for her newly pierced ears. Did you even know what Bactine was at I that did. point? Yeah, yeah. I have kids myself. I knew exactly what it was. Um, and I knew what the active ingredients were. But it's there in black and white. Annie died of lidocaine poisoning. Back at that gas station, crime scene investigators find what in any other case might be an innocuous piece of trash. But now Detective Jones considers it a smoking gun. We found near the car a Bactine bottle that had the lid removed. It's not a screw top bottle. It's something that requires a little bit of force to get off. And Annie's DNA is discovered on the exposed part of the bottle. The medical examiner who did the autopsy won't guess how the lidocaine got into Annie's system, calling it undetermined. But the seasoned detectives have no doubt. It's suicide. But who kills themselves with Bactine? People kill themselves. I've been in homicide for 15 years, and they get very creative. And this is just one of those methods. To the authorities, this was a pretty open and shut case. She died of a lidocaine overdose. Problem is, it's so rare to find that someone died of that kind of overdose that it's going to lead to some questions. This doesn't add up. This can't be. This is what you came up with, that she drank a bottle of Bactine? And the McCanns are taking notes on other things that don't add up. It was sound of the Baltimore police to consider suicide. It was, is, reprehensible to conclude suicide. They don't buy it, as they explain in an article they later write. If Annie was going to kill herself, they ask, why go all the way to Baltimore to do it? And if she drank that Bactine, why did the police not find her fingerprints on the bottle? Her prints and our prints should be all over that bottle. Who wipes fingerprints while killing themselves? 
And who writes a to-do list like Annie did on her hand if they're planning to end it all, reminding her to do her chores and say her prayers? We thought it was a baffling mystery. Nobody's heard of anybody overdosing on Bactine, much less a kid from the suburbs who didn't seem to be that unhappy with life. Uh, and so we continued to press forward with the story. And the story was far from over. When we come back, the McCanns are about to get disturbing new details about their daughter's death. Not from detectives or the medical examiner. Try the funeral director and why she thinks suicide is out of the question. We always thought murder right away. You thought murder we right did. away? We did. It's a ritual no parent should ever endure. Dan and Mary Jane McCann bury their daughter Annie a week after her death in this cemetery not far from their Virginia home. Please, please, can I do justice? Please, please, please. But no one is resting peacefully. In a curious and cruel blunder, the McCanns say the medical examiner's office failed to restore two of Annie's organs after her autopsy. Your daughter's heart and brain right. mm -hmm. were not returned to her body? No. No. How is that possible? I don't know. You, you tell me. The McCanns are outraged. They say it's unheard of and wonder if the medical examiner could somehow lose their daughter's heart and brain. What else was botched? That's where Diane Downey comes in. We tracked her down at this Alexandria funeral home where she spent 25 years preparing bodies for burial. She says she was unnerved after receiving Annie's. What did you think? There's absolutely no way this was a suicide with all the trauma on her body. Trauma? Dan and Mary Jane say police told them there was none. So what about the goose egg like bruise on Annie's forehead? So unsightly the McCanns hesitated over an open casket. I kept going back to the detectives, but they kept dismissing it as, no, they're, they're, they were just minor abrasions. They were told minor abrasions, no evidence of an assault. And they see this. And so now they're probably really thinking there's something more here. Downey was reluctant to share her suspicions with the grieving family. But the McCann's heartbreak and bewilderment only grew much later when they would get their daughter's autopsy photos. And I know these are hard for you to look at. They're convinced they see a cigarette burn on her forehead, a mysterious letter J on her ankle, and worst of all, they think they see signs of a sexual assault. I was horrified. It's like, oh my God, my daughter was tortured. The McCanns suspect that their daughter is a victim of a crime, especially when that funeral director points out what she sees as another bizarre detail. Annie's fingers. It looks to her that they're wilted. Her fingers were shriveled like they were raisins, like her body had been soaked for several hours. Did that concern you? Very much. Was this a result of someone trying to wash away evidence? Baltimore City Police will not reopen this investigation. The case is closed. Police may be standing down, but the McCanns are only ramping up their own investigation, and the media is all over the story. The McCanns have made it known they were not happy with their daughter's death investigation. And the parents are relentless. The police do nothing, and they sweep it under. Baltimore Police never on honestly investigated Annie's death. They begin emptying their savings, even Annie's college fund, to get at the truth, buying billboards around town and then assembling their own dream team, starting with perhaps America's most famous medical examiner, Dr. Michael Bodden, a fixture on Fox News. You looked through the materials. What struck you right away? What struck me right away was the circumstances first, that uh, she was found by a dumpster. Somebody dumped the body there after death, and usually that happens in homicidal situations. Bodden says in 50 years of death investigations, he's never heard of anyone killing themselves by drinking Bactine. And in his opinion, there wouldn't be enough lidocaine in one bottle to kill Annie anyway. So you were convinced that Annie McCann did not commit suicide by drinking Bactine? That was my opinion, yes. That's what it went for me personally. It went. Holy cow, she was murdered. Still no change in posture for the Baltimore police. 
If you come across being angry, no one's going to help you. You come across, if you're nice, no one's going to help you. Disappointed and desperate, the McCanns march on, all the way, in fact, up to Capitol Hill. This committee. To Senator Charles Grassley, one of the country. Swear I won't forget this, why do I regret this? In my mind reckless, thoughts are feeling endless Sitting up I'm breathless, anxiety's infectious I feel so defenseless, betrayed and embarrassed I hate being open, I hate being broken I feel like an ocean filled up with emotion Anger ain't a potion, rub it on like lotion I can feel it soaking, reopen, the scars have awoken I can't move on till I let go I feel so lost, never at home Need to be strong, every breath hold Cause I can't move on till I let go I can't move on till I let go I feel so lost, never at home Need to be strong, every breath hold Cause I can't move on till I let go
country's most powerful members of Congress, chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. If I can help, I want to help. From Iowa, he isn't even the McCann senator, but they don't call him Hawkeyes for nothing. Do you think the Baltimore PD blew it? It looks to me like uh, the, when they don't answer questions, they raise a lot of unnecessary suspicion. And if they want to avoid this suspicion, then it's pretty simple. Just come clean. Grassley sent off official letters to the Baltimore police and the FBI. They wrote back defending the investigation and stand by the conclusion Annie most likely died from self-ingestion of Bactine. But Grassley also wrote to the makers of Bactine, the Bayer Corporation, and got another story entirely. What exactly did you hear from Bayer about lidocaine? Pretty simple, that one bottle of Bactine would not cause a suicide. In fact, Bayer claims it previously told the Baltimore police the same thing. Back in here. Her body was found back in here? Yep, right in here. Which leads us to this man, the captain of the McCann Dream Team. It's not your usual death. This is, this is a mystery that stumped everybody. I mean, there's other Jim Consis, a private eye and former Baltimore cop himself, now on Annie's trail. Her name's Annie, white girl Annie. from Virginia. No, no, her. He retraced his steps with us. I canvassed the whole area, mm -hmm. went door to door for months. Literally walking me through his investigation. Hey, guys. Approaching anyone and everyone he could, like these folks at the Perkins homes. So we're just trying to fill in the blanks on how the body got behind the dumpster. But have you ever heard of anybody talking about the case? No? Did you hear any scuttlebutt about it uh, when you moved in? Like, no. What, what might have happened to it? No. Then, hitting the road. Now we're getting in the heart of Fells Point. So Annie might have been here on Halloween night. Yeah, she could have been. The key for Consus, determining where Annie was after leaving home and with whom. What would this area be like on Halloween? It's packed, because all the bars are down there. In fact, Fells Point is one big party on Halloween, with throngs of young people celebrating and taping the festivities. This footage shot the very night Annie disappeared. Consus says Annie may have been among the revelers. Then, a big moment on this quiet block of Albemarle Street. This is basically Blue Willie. You got all the Italian restaurants here. He arrives here, Vaccaro's, a Baltimore bakery famous for its pastries. When we come back, a very sweet clue. And the trail doesn't end in that bakery. Who are the McCanns about to question inside this prison? Stay with us. Vicaro's Pastry Shop is a landmark in Baltimore's Little Italy. He wants an espresso. Famous for cappuccino and cannoli, it would become the setting for a stunning development in the case of Annie McCann. What brought you here? I know she had a sweet tooth, and uh, her body was found over there, and uh, she loved yogurt pastries, and I'm thinking, why not take a shot? It's three months after Annie's death, and the McCann family private investigator, Jim Kuntzis, is showing Annie's wow. picture to workers here. So you came up to the counter here? Yeah, I came, I came up to the counter. A clerk takes a look at the picture. One guy goes, oh, yeah, yeah, I think I, I remember her. Yeah, she was, she, she was cute. Then a server sees the photo, and it's as if someone dropped a pile of dishes. Oh, my gosh. Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. That's she her. her. She was here. Here, alive and well, sipping a cappuccino with extra whipped cream. Then a jaw-dropping revelation. Annie was not alone. Yeah, 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 she was with another girl. And then that's when the description came out. A sketch artist is soon giving that description a face. So you got the server here to give you the details to come up with the sketch. Right, and then once the sketch was complete, she looked at it and she says, that's her. This is Annie's companion, according to a waitress. A haunting image of a tall, dark-haired woman, older than Annie, late teens, early 20s, disheveled, tired, looking like trouble. She had heavy, heavy makeup. She had the ugliest fingernail polish you would ever see. It's puke yellow. I'll puke never, yellow. Puke yellow. She had heavy-duty bags underneath her eyes. 
looked like she was tired. As a detective, what's going on in your head at this moment? I'm thinking, oh, that's good, I got a hit. Do you think this woman could be the key to solving this right. death? Right. This is big stuff, isn't it? No, it ultimately does not have anything to do with Annie's death. Sean Jones, the lead Baltimore detective on the case, says they looked into it and he is not impressed. Not by the sighting of Annie, not by the mystery woman with her. But if she's sitting and having a coffee or a dessert with a disheveled young woman, sure, that doesn't important. set off any bells for you? Of course it does. It's important, but ultimately we weren't able to verify that it even happened. The McCanns also released this sketch of a woman seen with Annie in Little Italy the day before her death. The McCanns publicized the sketch, hoping someone will recognize the girl with puke-colored fingernails, one person who might possibly be able to shed light on their daughter's death. There have been many leads over the years, but they've never been able to track her down. Every time they would find a lead, then they, you know, hit a dead end, and it's like the mystery continues. Just when many might have given up, the case of Annie McCann takes another strange turn. Nearly three years after her death, a murder with what seemed to be eerie parallels makes the news in Baltimore. 26-year-old Lakeisha Player is murdered and her car stolen. When police name the killer, the McCanns are flabbergasted. Police believe the killer is this man, 21-year-old Darnell Kinlaw. Darnell Kinlaw is accused of murdering Lakeisha Player in her Kentucky Avenue home this month and stealing her car. The same Darnell Kinlaw previously questioned in Annie's case and who the McCanns believe had been involved in tossing their daughter's body and taking her Volvo on that joyride. That same guy then gets arrested for murdering someone and taking their car. It's a big coincidence. Annie's case comes roaring back into the headlines. The arrest was of 21-year-old Darnell Kinlaw for the murder of his girlfriend. Kinlaw was eventually charged with the unlawful taking of Annie McCann's car in 2008. Awfully close to the same kind of circumstances. And I'd argue otherwise. He shot her and stole her car in a domestic incident. Has no similarities to Annie's case. Do you think he knows more than he's told you? No. As a matter of fact, I think that it tells the opposite, that if he were to murder someone, he's going to use a gun, he's going to use the standard method, and that he's not going to poison someone with lidocaine. For years, the McCanns have wanted to question Kinlaw themselves, convinced they might be able to get something more out of him about Annie's death. Now, on a gray June day, nearly eight years after Annie's death, they will get their chance. Kinlaw has surprisingly agreed to meet with them. Dan and Mary Jane leave their Fairfax County home for the nearly three-hour ride across Maryland. Are you nervous? No. Oh, yeah. Because I know that it might not, we might not get anything. Yeah, that's what I fully expect. They might accidentally tell the truth and do it on purpose. We're going to interview one of what we believe are five thugs, at least four, and we believe five, who dumped Annie's dead or dying body from her car and then took the car for a joyride. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. And Praying as they drive and strategizing. We want to know the circumstances under which he found the car, found Danny, had he seen her before, had he seen her with anybody else, and uh, uh, can he please find it in his heart to, uh, to help us find out who, not him, murdered our beautiful daughter. Coming up, are the McCanns face-to-face -face with their daughter's killer? Does Darnell Kinlaw have answers about Annie? Watch what happens next. Twenty Twenty continues with answers for Annie. Dan and Mary Jane McCann drive 150 miles across Maryland, doing the kind of detective work they say the Baltimore police are not. They're going to question Darnell Kinlaw, a young man they believe was involved in dumping their daughter's body and joyriding in her car in Baltimore nearly eight years ago. Kinlaw's now doing 30 years for murdering his girlfriend, Lakeisha Player, and taking her car. That takes a lot of guts. For these parents to walk into a maximum security prison and sit down and interview a man who they think may have killed their daughter, 
He was on the other side of thick glass. And we could hear each other very well. They make small talk with the killer and even pray together. And I said, and Darnell, uh, I take it from your letter, you're Christian. And he said, yes. I said, would you mind if we started with a prayer? And he said, no. And he and joined us. Then Dan gets down to brass tacks. Our first question was, this is maybe the hardest question we're going to ask you, DJ, or maybe the easiest. Did you kill our daughter? No. You know, we've had to ask, OK. They say Kinlaw seemed genuinely upset at times, but as he looked into their heartbroken faces, they say he offered nothing that would end their misery. We're okay. Nothing, nothing. So we, we've worked a long time to get to see Darnell Kinlaw. Finally got to, and we got pretty much what we expected, which is nothing. We learned that he knows almost nothing about Annie's death. Weary after struggling nearly eight years now to prove that their daughter didn't take her own life, the McCann's anger toward the Baltimore police is as raw as ever. We questioned lead detective Sean Jones about the McCann's accusations, and we also confronted his boss, Colonel Stanley Branford. The McCann's say that the Baltimore Police Department took the easy way out. By labeling this a suicide, they were able to wash their hands of it and move on to another crime. I'm sorry that they feel that way, but that's simply uh, not the way we approach this case. I can tell you that this case has been thoroughly investigated, not only uh, by us, uh, by the FBI, that we asked to come in and evaluate um, our investigation. Doesn't this family deserve more answers? Um, we've given them all we can give. We cannot provide answers that we do not have. We possibly believe that Annie McCann committed suicide. Suicide. But this is a girl who lived in the suburbs. Why would she drive 50 miles to a housing project in Baltimore to commit suicide? Well, um, that I can't answer because I don't know the mindset of uh, Annie at that time. But police do share stunning evidence with us the McCanns did not. We already knew about the letter Annie wrote saying she was going to kill herself and changed her mind. But now police revealed their investigation found other notes in which Annie talks about suffering with anorexia and depression. She writes to a friend, my suicide has nothing to do with you. In another note, pressure has gotten to me. I can't do it anymore. And no one blamed themselves for this. This is all on me. In all of her writings, she had indicated that uh, she was leaving and, and she expressed to some degree uh, that she was tired of living. In response, the McCanns insist Annie did not intend those as suicide notes. One was found crumpled up under her bed, the other partly crossed out. Now, my heart goes out to her parents. We have responded to every request uh, that they made. We responded to every piece of information that came in. After 1,200 hours on the case, the Baltimore Police Department stands by its belief that Annie took her own life by drinking back tea. It's a critical question at the core of Annie McCann's death. Is there enough lidocaine in a single five ounce bottle of Bactine to kill a 16 year old girl? The McCann's medical experts are at odds with the Baltimore ME. So 2020 contacted Dr. Bill Mannion, a board certified forensic pathologist. He estimates he's determined cause and manner of death in 2,500 cases over the years, but not one of them involved Bactine or lidocaine. Bactine, I had never heard of that before. I, I, to be honest, I didn't know it was capable of, of killing you, but it is capable because it has lidocaine in it, and lidocaine is a toxic drug. He says a bottle of Bactine does contain a potentially fatal dose of lidocaine. Yes, there is enough in a bottle of Bactine to kill someone. Even in a half a bottle, they're roughly two grams, and that would be enough to cause death. Even the McCann's own expert, Dr. Bodden, says some of their worst fears about what happened to their daughter are unfounded. The funeral director felt convinced that she saw signs that Annie might have been sodomized. Did you see any indication of that in either the photos or in any of the material you reviewed? No, I didn't. Well, I don't see evidence that she was uh, uh, sexually assaulted. As for that distinctive looking letter J on Annie's ankle, Dr. Bowden says it may just be an accidental pattern from blood settling. It was uh, the way the lividity, the blood settled in the body after she had died. So you don't a, think that was an, a marking, a letter, some kind of a tattoo? That's correct. You I don't did, think so? I, don't, I do not think so. There's also some talk that there may have been a cigarette burn on her head. I don't think it was a cigarette burn. 
You don't think that was another no. sign of some kind of abuse? No. On one of our visits with the McCanns, they show us bins of evidence they say the police returned to them. How long has it been since you've gone through these things? Years. And there, among Annie's things, a discovery that seems to surprise even her parents. She didn't what take that, that one. Digital it. camera. Her digital camera still sealed in a police evidence bag. Is it possible this has gone untouched and unnoticed for nearly eight years? Mary Jane plugs the memory card into a laptop. When we come back, what Annie's camera saw. Stay with us. Nearly eight years after Annie McCann's strange death in Baltimore, her parents do something they say they've never done before, search the memory card of her camera, stored among evidence in their garage. This is what they find. 14 photos, apparently taken by Annie. It says May 2008. But the pictures couldn't be more innocent. Breezy, just the dog. It's Annie's old pal, the family dog, Breezy Max. Later, Baltimore police tell us they checked that camera years ago. Yet another disappointing dead end. But the McCanns are determined to keep fighting. Her death needs to be changed to homicide. The McCanns feel that the Baltimore PD botched this case. Did yes. you botch it? No, ma'am. Not at all. What if you're wrong? What if there's a murderer out there and you missed it? I'm not. You're convinced that this is a suicide? Yes, ma'am. No doubt in your mind? None whatsoever. There is absolutely no evidence to indicate that this is a murder. Recently, Mary Jane took another road trip. An emotional journey to Baltimore. We're going to go meet Wanda Player. She is just a really very special lady. That special lady Wanda is Lakeisha Player's aunt. The McCanns bonded with her when the two families were attending court appearances for Lakeisha's killer, Darnell Kinlaw. 